Creator, creation. The difference is clear, but do we clearly differentiate the line between, or does it get blurry? Because it seems to me that we so easily see through the self-prescribed lenses of a false reality, where life's a game and we're the chess masters, controlling the moves of our own destinies, trusting our own strategies. And oftentimes we're inclined to elevate earthly things to the status of divine. And if you'll permit me to state the obvious, Anything worshipped as God that isn't God is just a disappointing imitation. It can't handle the divine elevation. But there's nothing obvious about what's obvious when you're seeing through a false reality of deception. So let's refocus our perception with a question. To whom can you compare God? Let every idol be considered a fraud because there's only one who holds the oceans in his hand. He's measured the cosmological expand. Now the line of distinction is sharpening. There's one creator of everything, but just in case we're still tempted to replace him by erasing the line, let's look in the mirror for a clear view of us. We are like the grass that fades with the weather, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Look at the stars, billions of burning suns. God made them all, and by name he calls each one. God's the real captain, and his words like a compass redirecting our sight to the light of his all-encompassing glory. But there's more to the story, because those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So this divine view is really good news, because we are infinitesimally small, but loved by the infinite God of all. What is the weirdest, craziest, off-the-wall thing that you have ever done in your life? Now, I'm not talking about have you ever jumped out of a plane with a parachute? Have you ever jumped off a bridge uh, attached to a bungee cord and survived to tell about it? That's cool. That's great. That's awesome. That scares me to death. I would never want to do that. But what I'm asking you, what is the weirdest, craziest you know, off the wall where you did this and people were thinking, wow, that's strange, you know. That's what, that's what I did when I was 16 years old. I was thinking through this and I thought, you know, when I was 16, I did something that was pretty off the wall. It was pretty strange. It was pretty out there. I entered a soapbox derby race and this is what it looked like right here on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Check that haircut out. Uh-huh. I'm 16 years old there. Yeah. And uh, I entered this soapbox derby race. And the, th the thing about this soapbox derby race is that it, uh, it obviously didn't have to have the prescribed wheels and the per particular body size and all that kind of stuff and conform to the soapbox derby rules. It was basically a race that was going to go down a soapbox derby track down the hill. It all had to be gravity propelled. You couldn't do anything, put a motor in it or anything like that. And you could, do, you could build it any way you want. So I had this friend, and we decided to build it with the best, coolest seat possible. And we thought, well, that's a toilet. We, we're going to get a toilet seat. We're going to paint it, maybe clean it, but we're going to put it on this little board here. And then we're thinking, now we got some weight. Let's forget those little go-kart, you know, wheels. Let's find some big wheels. Let's, let's go and get a bicycle, a couple of them, take the wheels off and put them on there. And then let's get these, you know, little boards and kind of two-by-fours, put them there and find these little axles and put them in there and kind of just nail them down. I mean, literally, that's what we did. That's just kind of put these little claw nails down and try to keep them on there and hope it would work. You can see here that it looks like the axle's broken over here on the front. Well, I want to tell you that this off-the-wall thing was something that actually worked. And we decided to kind of, 
even go off the wall a little bit more and use it as an intimidation factor. So we dressed up as a superhero, and that's what I'm doing here. Yeah, that's my superhero outfit. Yeah, still have that. Can't, can't fit into it, but probably still have that somewhere. Yeah, and so we went, and we decided to enter the race, and it was a bunch of heats, and lo and behold, we found ourselves in the finals. We had won a bunch of heats and got into the finals, so there's like maybe four, uh, you know, carts out there, all different shapes, all different kinds of things, but I think ours was pretty much mostly off the wall. It was pretty, pretty cool, and so it was my turn to ride the cart, so I get in the cart for the championship race. We're all there. The blocks go down. It's just gravity. Come out of the gate, man, and the toilet is going, baby. I mean, it's running hard, and I'm out in front. It's looking good, and the axle collapses on me. I wipe out. The toilet bowl falls off, shatters all porcelain all over the place. I, trying to cover myself, look around, see if there's anything attached, see if I'm still alive. I am. I grabbed the toilet seat, which was there. I ran across the finish line, and I came in last. Yeah. (laughs) But I finished. I finished the race, and it was a ton of fun. It was super off the wall. It was just like, hey, a toilet? Let's put it on there. Let's make it happen. Now, I would imagine that you have some uh, stories that you could share with me that are pretty off the wall. They're pretty strange. They're out there. But I'm betting that you can't share any stories that compete or match the stories of the Old Testament prophets and the strange and wild and crazy things that the Lord had them do. Let me give you some examples. Hosea, he's a minor prophet in the Old Testament. He's a guy who God said, you need to get married and you need to go marry that woman over there. And by the way, she's a prostitute. You good with that? And he did. Then there was this guy named Jeremiah. And God said to Jeremiah, here, why don't you put this harness on this this yoke that an ox would wear. And I want you to wear that around for a few days and then I want you to go talk to the king. You good with that? Great. Awesome. And then there was a guy by the name of, of uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel was probably the wildest prophet out there in terms of the crazy things that God would have him do. There's so many of them, I probably can't even list them, but I'll list a few of them. He cut off his hair. He threw his hair into the fire. Then he laid down on his side, strapped, him so that he, strapped himself so that he couldn't move. He had to be on his side, and he was there for 430 days. That's a year and a couple months. 430 days laying on his side, and what he ate, he cooked with the fuel of cow manure. Hey, cow manure and the smell, and it gets into the food, and that's what he ate. Well, all these prophets did these things because God instructed them to do so, and he had them do so because God was trying to send a message to the people of God to turn from sin, to to the pagan nations to repent. And so everything they did had a message behind it. Hosea married this prostitute because it was an illustration of God's redemptive ability to embrace people who have been unfaithful. And he was showing that by giving that picture. Jeremiah wore those ox kind of yoke thing and went to the king because he wanted to demonstrate that The prophecy was coming that God's people were going to be in bondage, in slavery to Babylon. And Ezekiel, why did Ezekiel do all these wild and strange, crazy things? Well, he ate this food with the cow manure as fuel to to cook it and all that kind of stuff because he wanted to let the people know that they were going to go into bondage and that they were going to eat unclean food. And he also wanted them to know that he was going to lay on his side bound to that in that position for, those, for that period of time because that was going to show the punishment that was coming to Israel and Judah. You see, the life of a prophet was extreme. Absolutely extreme. Totally out there. Totally off the wall. And yet, they were obedient because that's what God was calling them to do because the message was more important. And that message had to get communicated What did Isaiah do that was off the wall? Some of you probably would know this. Isaiah was told by God to get naked, literally. To take his clothes off and to walk around the land, not for one day, not for a week, not for a month, 
but for three years. He walked in the land for three years with nothing on. You think about the shame of that. You go back to the garden, right? And Adam and Eve fall, and, 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 and they see that they are naked and they are ashamed. Well, God told you know, Isaiah to get naked for Jesus. And literally, it says that he did that so that he could bring the naked truth of sin to God's people. That they would hear it plain and clear. No, no garb, no nothing. Just straight up, here it is. Here's your sin. Well, I, Isaiah, and like many other prophets, they were here to proclaim the word of God. And here in verse, or in chapter 40 of Isaiah, there's three things that Isaiah brings to bear on the people. Okay? First of all, he brings... The coming judgment, he's going to foreshadow the coming judgment that's coming. He's going to talk about the coming Messiah. And thirdly, he's going to talk about how God's people should live in light of that covenant that they have with God. How to live, right? And so that's the message that we're going to hear here in chapter 40. And I think for us to fully understand this message, we need to think about What is the context of the people at this time? What was going on among God's people when chapter 40 was being proclaimed, when chapter 40 was being announced, right? There's three things that I want to show you today. First one is that they were a people who needed comfort. He's speaking to a people who needed comfort. During that time, the the people, God's people, were in captivity in Babylon. They were living in exile. There was much chaos in their lives. They had been pulled from their roots, pulled from their home. There was war. There was racial strife. There was persecution everywhere. Chaos, and they needed comfort. That's why verse 1 says, comfort, comfort, my people. God proclaims and brings them comfort. So they were a people who needed comfort. They were also a people who had lost sight of God's sovereignty. In other words, they had lost sight of the fact that God had a plan and that God wasn't gone and that God was there and was orchestrating what was going on and that he was still in control. They needed to hear that. They needed to hear that to bring them a sense of comfort, but they had gotten to a point where they underestimated who God was. They took him for granted, and they began to say things like, well, what have you done for me lately, God? That that one was good last month, but what have you done for me lately? And they began to judge God, to judge him moment by moment, and they began to want God to fulfill their own desires to be A God who would serve them rather than a people who would serve God. It sounds a little bit like that wondering and wrestling stage that Habakkuk was in last week. And then they were a people who were desperately in need of God's strength. In chapter 40, verse 30, it says, Even youths shall faint and be weary, young men shall fall exhausted. Imagine what it would have been to be away from your home, to be in exile, to be in slavery, to be in bondage. You would have been faint. You would have been weary. You certainly would have been exhausted, even as a young man. I think this is a message for us today. These things here are what we need today. Why is that the case? Because God's Word is living and active. God's word is living and it's active. And when we open up his word and we, we read it in, in, in the power of the Holy Spirit, God shows us in every case that is relevant to our lives. And that will be the case 60 years from now and 100 years from now until he comes. It's always relevant. It is living and it is active. And we can even see how these things are something that 
is relevant to us today. I mean, even though this was written 3,000 years ago, it's relevant today. We need comfort. We need comfort today because we do live in an age of chaos. There is rampant crime and violence and runaway deficit and racial strife and constant threat to our freedom. Are we any different than the people of Isaiah? We do need comfort. We also need to know that God is not something that is, you know, for us. You know, we need to understand that he is in charge, that, that he's in control, that he has a plan, and that we serve him. We need to hear that. We don't want to get it upside down. And we also know that at every point in our lives, we need strength for every single day. I mean, every day I need strength. Every day I needed strength as a 16-year-old, and I need strength as a 56-year-old. I said it right there. You've been wondering, huh? Yeah, I know, I know. But I need a strength, and so do you. That's why it says in the last verse, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Like an eagle, like a runner, like a hiker, going to soar, you're not going to be weary, you're not going to faint. We need that. And verse 31 is the crescendo of this passage. If this was a song, someone would sing this song, or if it was a poem, someone would read this poem where everything is leading up to verse 31, where it's all happening at verse 31. And the voice would get louder and the song would get louder. It would start quiet and it would build and it would build and it would build until you hit verse 31. And we would see that in verse 31 that as we wait upon the Lord, He will renew our strength. And then he gives pictures of what that would look like. So what does that word wait mean? If that's the crescendo, if that's like what this is all about, then we need to figure out what that word wait means. That word wait means trust. In Hebrew, that word is trust. It's to place all your weight in God. It's like being a rock climber, putting that little thing, whatever that's called, that little spike into the mountain, throwing the rope around it, and putting all your weight on it as you climb. And as you climb and you grab the mountain, you know that if you fall and it goes hard, that's going to hold you because you have trusted in that. That's the kind of trust, that's what this passage is talking about. Those who put their weight, their confidence, their hope, those who lean in on God, those who trust God, will be renewed in strength. That's where we want to be. That's what this passage is. In Isaiah 40, here Isaiah gives us a picture that I think will reinforce our trust and our confidence in him. It's a picture that's going to encourage us, and it's a picture that's going to humble us. But ultimately, it's going to be a picture that shows you how big and great and awesome is our God. And it, it, it's my hunch, if the Lord is working, which I believe he is in his people, that our worship's going to be pretty special when we're done today. Because we're going to see how big God is and how worthy he is of our worship. And I expect to see us raise the roof today. we got some time. We're going to do that at the end of the service and praise him because he is awesome. He is great. He is big. He is worthy. And so as we look at this picture this morning, we're going to find that God is the rock that we're anchored to. And Isaiah shows us that by giving us four pictures of who God is. Let's take a look at the first one. God is the creator. God is the creator. Creation literally means that God created something out of nothing. You know, he did that. You go to the account in Genesis, first couple of chapters, it says that every time God spoke, something was created. 
He spoke the light. He spoke the darkness. He, 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 he spoke mankind. He spoke animals. He spoke plants. As he spoke, bam, there it was. He even spoke the universe and the stars, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. As he spoke it, it came into being. He is the creator. Look at verses 25 and 26 in chapter 40. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out the host by numbers, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, he and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. He's talking about the stars. He's talking about the stars. You see, during the captivity, there were pagan gods that were being worshipped, that the pagan nation of Babylon was pressing in on God's people, and some of God's people went with it. And they began to worship the stars, astrology. We're going to get in it, and we're going we're to worship this, and we're going to figure out what this is. But God says here in this passage, he's the one who put the stars up there. And you need to be worshiping the creator, not the creature, not the star, right? And so God is the only God, the God of Israel is the only God who is worthy of our worship because he created it, he controls it, and he preserves those stars. He puts them up there. It says, by his power, because of his power, not one is missing. Now think about that for a moment. If you lived in Isaiah's time, you would go out on a clear night and you would look up and with the naked eye, maybe you see 5,000 stars or so up there, which is a lot, it appears, right? But you know there's more than that up there. Scientists say today that there's an estimated 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And I I didn't know this. Did you know that there are estimated to be 125 billion galaxies like the Milky Way? (laughs) Okay, so now you're starting to see the numbers here. 400 billion in the Milky Way, 125 billion. Billion galaxies like the Milky Way for a total estimated number of 10 billion trillion stars. 10 billion trillion stars. God has named them all. (laughs) And if you need help understanding what that is, I'm not a mathematician, but In today's world, you go to the internet, you find something that helps you. And this helped me figure out what a trillion was. I mean, what is a trillion? I mean, how many zeros is that? I don't even know. But there are, you know, 10 billion trillion of them up there. Let's go check it out here. This is how we would say it. A million is equal to a thousand thousands. A thousand times a thousand. A billion is equal to... To a thousand millions, a thousand times a million. A trillion is equal to a thousand billions, a thousand times a billion, or a million times a million. Now, if that doesn't help you, because it didn't help me at all, because I don't get that. But I get this. How long ago is a trillion seconds? If we were to measure time in seconds, how long is a trillion seconds? A million seconds is 12 days ago. A billion seconds is 31 years ago. A trillion seconds is 30,000 B.C. before Christ. That's in seconds. Wow. One trillion, 30,000 B.C. Is that not helpful? Let's go here. How how high is a trillion in a $1,000 bill? I'd love to have just a $1,000 bill. But how high is a trillion in a $1,000 bill? Well, A million dollars equals four inches high. A billion dollars equals 364 feet high. And a trillion dollars equals 63 miles high. You with me? Yeah, a little wow factor maybe? Okay, let's keep going. If a person's salary is $40,000 per per year, and they would save that every year, it would take 25 years to earn a million, 25 thousand years to earn a billion 25 million years to earn one trillion okay you need one more if you live to be 80 years of age if you live to be 80 years of age one million 
to get what if one million to get to one million, you would have to save thirty four dollars each day of your life. One billion, you would have to save thirty four thousand each day of your life. And lastly, one trillion, you'd have to save thirty four million dollars each day of your life. Three hundred sixty five days in a year times eighty. Okay, a little wow. Come on, say wow. Yeah, okay, that's good. It's, I think it's wow. I think that's amazing. Now, here, here, here you think, well, okay, well, that's a lot. I get it. Enough said. You killed that one. You went too far. Okay. Well, here's the deal. Let's remember that one trillion is what we just talked about. There's an estimated 10 billion of those up in the heavens. 10 billion trillion stars are estimated there. And God named them all. Wow. He's a pretty big God. We go to chapter uh, 40, go back to chapter 40, verse 12. We read some more pictures of how big God is. Matter of fact, it says in there, in verse 12, that God can measure all of those billions and trillions stars with the span of his hand. I had to look up what a span of a hand is. That's what a span of a hand is. From the tip of your thumb to the tip of your pinky, that's a span. God does that. He's got them covered. It's pretty big. Then the other image they give there is that who will measure the waters in the hollow of his hand? That's a hollow. That's what that is. And then I looked it up. 71% of the earth's surface is water. He has that right there. That's big. That's pretty impressive. And then it talks about the fact that enclosed in the dust of the earth is a measure. It would be like taking your measuring cup of flour and putting it in a bowl. That simple. God takes something, measures, brings it up, dumps it. He's a big God. And then finally, the word picture that we're given of how immense he is and how big is he is, that he weighs the mountains and scales and the hills in balance. It'd be like taking one of those old-fashioned weight scales, and you put something on this side, and it's a little heavier. Maybe it's the mountains that are over here. And then they throw some hills in over here, and then it goes here, and then they get it all balanced out. That's God. That's what he does with the mountains and with the hills. He's big. He's awesome. He's up there. He's transcendent. He's worthy of our worship. But is he? In Romans chapter 1, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his earthly power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived Ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they're without excuse. Paul says, no one's without excuse. Everyone should know there is a God because you just look out and you see how great his creation is. But what does man do with that? Paul reads, we read on with Paul here in verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened claiming to be wise they became fools why were they fools because they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men birds and animals and creeping things they made idols and they worshiped that they worshiped creeping things instead of this awesome God Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in their lusts of the heart to impurity, to the dishonor of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served, here it is, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So that happened for Paul. Paul was explaining that to the people there in Rome and now we go back into captivity And during Isaiah's day, and we see right there in verses 18 through 20 that what Paul has just described, Isaiah's people are doing. They are crafting idols. They they, they, they have turned their back on God. They, They don't believe who he is. They look around, they see, they're without excuse, and they pursue an idol. They start crafting them, they start making them. It says they they make them out of gold and they find really good craftsmen to build them. And and when they build them, they make sure they anchor them down with chains. Why? 
because they don't want them to fall over. They don't want these idols that they've made to fall over and to topple. Are you serious? Really? They're worshiping something they have to anchor down, something that has to keep from falling over? God doesn't topple over. God doesn't need anything to chain him down. God is somebody who is worthy. God is big. God is awesome. God is the only thing that should be worshiped. And I tell you what, when we turn our backs on that, the little G gods, that's what I like to call them, the little G gods that we've created in our lives, they begin to topple over. Right? The gods of fame, they topple over. The gods of finance, the gods of leisure, the gods of technology, the gods of physical fitness, they all top, topple over. They all fall. But God will never, ever fall Matter of fact, says in verse 28, God is the everlasting God, the creator, who will not grow weary. (laughs) He's not going to get tired on you. He's not going to topple over. Psalm 53, 1 says, the fool says there is no God. Will we be wise and choose God, the creator, or will we be a fool now and choose these little G gods? Don't be a fool. Be wise. Here's the wonder of it all. The wonder of God's creation is, means that when we meet the creator God face to face and we walk in a relationship and in step with him, everything changes. Transformation happens. And God gets a hold of our lives when we begin to worship the right thing, which is God, not little g gods. That's the first picture. Second picture, God is the conqueror. God is the conqueror. Isaiah knew that his people needed to know that someday they would be conquerors of their oppressors. I mean, look at this. In verse 3 and then 4 and 5, we'll look at here in a moment, Isaiah says, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, where does that phrase, how come that's like, "Mm, I remember that. Where's that from? John the Baptist. That's what John the Baptist said when he ushered in the ministry of Jesus, when Jesus' earthly ministry began here on earth. That's what he said. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Essentially what this means is, is, is that the word prepare here means to clear away obstacles. God is coming And we and he will move away obstacles. That as these obstacles are moved, the path is made clear, the kingdom of God will be ushered in upon his return. That's why it says mountains will will be reduced, valleys will be brought up, there will be a clear path, a road where God's saints can enter in to the kingdom of God. Verse 4 says that at the Lord's appearance, nature will submit to his will. (laughs) Nature will submit to his will. Verse 5 says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and will be glorified in his conquering. Right? Glorified in his conquering. Jesus the conqueror has come. He's conquered sin. He's conquered death. He's conquered hell. And upon his return, we will see his glory And it will happen not because of what has happened in history. It will happen because God said so. Because God is the creator. God is big. And he is our conqueror. And he sent his son. And his son is the conquering hero. His son is the king that will come. So then we look even further. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 9 and 10 continues to point out that the Lord's power and reign will come. And the specific thought here in these verses is that King Jesus is coming and in his coming he will subdue his enemies. That's the thought. The king is coming and the enemies will be subdued. And God's people will be set free. That's the picture here. God's people out of captivity are coming out of the valley and they're going to the mountaintop of victory. They're coming back to Jerusalem. They're coming home. It's a huge celebration. 
They've been in captivity, and now God has conquered Babylon, and they are free, and they're returning home, and there's some stuff they're going to have to clean up, but they're coming home. It's a day to be remembered. It's a day of victory. This is preached about and talked about and proclaimed and prophesied in Isaiah 52, where it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Bring forth together into singing your places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem, it's a powerful, powerful picture. And we need to understand that, that that's what will happen one day, prophesied that when Jesus comes, we're going home. New heaven, new earth, paradise, back to the garden. It's going to be an awesome, awesome day. I was trying to get a feel for this and a picture of this, and I, I, I thought of World War II. I love American history. I love to study American history. My dad loves history. We talk around the table to this day about American history. We love to talk about the books we're reading, the things that he's reading, the things he's sharing. But you know why I really love American history? Because my grandpa, who was a very important man in my life, very significant in my life, he was a World War II vet. And I remember as a little boy going to his house in the Midwest, and he'd get me up with my brothers, three brothers, and we'd sit on his lap. He was a big bear of a man, and he could tell a story. Boy, he could tell a story. And we'd always say, tell me a story, tell me a story. I mean, we'd just sing that out, and finally he'd say, okay, I'm going to tell you about the war. And he'd talk to us about the stuff that would happen on the battlefield. He was, he was in Europe, man. He was on the field, man. He shot grenade or uh, uh, bazookas the whole deal man he was out there and as a little boy oh my goodness he was cool I mean I just wanted to hang out with him he was awesome and he would tell me these stories and I would imagine what would it be like to be a soldier to be in World War II to to experience that and to be there and you know even today I wonder what it would be like to experience World War II. You know that World War II, I believe, and there's a lot of books that say this, a lot of scholars that say this, World War II was the most united America has ever been. M- maybe at, at, in the colonies at the beginning, I suppose, but it was a significant time, 1939 to 1945. Every man, woman, and child were involved in the war to win freedom for America, to win freedom for the world, right? They were all involved. Women were working in factories, children were working in factories, people were building tanks, airplanes, all kinds of stuff was happening. And then the men were out there, they were fighting, women were there, and, 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 and they were fighting for the cause. The most united we've ever been. I don't know if we ever will be as America, I don't know. But at that time they were. And that's, I think, why it fascinates me so. And I start thinking through all the stuff of, that I would want to be at. If I could be this little mouse and I could go to these corners and these rooms and these places and these battlefields, what would I want to see? I, I, there'd be a lot of things. You know, I'd want to be in Congress when FDR declared war. I'd want to be there when, when, when Pearl Harbor was bombed and, 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 and FDR comes in and all the military leaders and all, all the leaders there and, and, and he's speaking and he's saying, War is declared. Today is a day that will live in infamy. I'd want to be there. I'd want to be on any of the, 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 the islands, the remote islands out in the Pacific. I'd want to be there on Iwo Jima when the flag is raised. I'd want to be there. I'd want to be at the door when the Germans came knocking on Corey Ten Boom's door. I, I, I would, I would want to be there when, when FDR dies in his fourth term as president and the war's still going on and he has started this secret project called the atom bomb and the vice president who now becomes president, Harry Truman, 
has no idea that bomb has even been built. And he gets informed, hey, we got this bomb. You want to use it? <laughs> really? I don't want to be there. As he had those conversations, he says, we're going to drop the bomb. Here we go. I'd want to be with FDR and Churchill wherever they were. <laughs> that would be a powerful place to be, hanging out with these men. I, I, I know that they met in remote places, secret places, out in the Atlantic, on a ship. They were always talking. I would have loved to hear any of those conversations. But here's the deal. Here's the place I would really want to be. Because this is, for me, this would have been the climax of it all. This would have been verse 31, man. This would have been the climax. I'd want to be there when VJ Day was announced. I'd want to be there at the end of the war. I'd want to be there and declare that uh, when the war was declared, done. And I would want to be in America when all the soldiers were returning and all the families and the wives and the kids and the relatives would gather and they'd celebrate and, and they would talk about this is what we were doing while you were doing this. We were united. And now we have freedom. Freedom. Oh, man, that would be so, so cool for me. That would be the epitome of joy. I'd be overwhelmed. I'd be in tears. It would be so emotional. But I'm going to tell you this morning, believer, nothing, nothing will compare to that day when Jesus returns. Nothing. Not even close. It's the day of all days, and we will be going home. We'll be coming home. The battle will be done. It'll be over. And we're coming home. Jesus, I'm coming home, man. Paradise, worship, fellowship, sweet, sweet, sweetness, man. No more tears. No more crying. Just peace and fulfillment and joy and worship and Jesus. That's where I want to be. That's the greatest part, man. That's what I want to see. And I know as a believer, I pray that that's where you would want to be as well. And if you don't know Jesus today, he's coming. He's coming. There's time. There is time. And there's time until he comes. And so we live with a sense of urgency. And as a non-believer, you need to begin to think. And we're, we're ready to talk with you. At any point, we want to see you come to know the Lord and go home with him one day and live forever. It would be awesome. God is the commander. God is the commander. I like this word. Commander. Master and commander, right? <laughs> I love this word. This is why I love the word, because this word to me speaks control, change, so, or being in charge and sovereignty, man, because that's who God is. He's in control. He's in charge. He's sovereign. He is Lord of all. And he commands it all. I like that. I mean, ugh, that's just like feels like I'm, ah, I want to command that stuff. And that's what he does. That's who he is. In verse 13 and 14 it says, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what has man shown him his counsel? Who did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the paths of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? These verses tell us that God doesn't need a counselor. He doesn't need advice. He doesn't need instruction. He doesn't need to take a course on how to be God. He doesn't need to be enlightened. No one teaches God. <laughs> no one teaches God. Paul speaks of this perfection that God gives us in his unsearchable wisdom and his knowledge when he says in Romans 11, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways for who has known the mind of God or who has been his counselor for from him, get this, for from him and through him and to him is all things. He commands it all. And he commands it in his wisdom and in his knowledge. He has the playbook. He has our playbook, and he has the evil one's playbook. Wouldn't that be great? You're going to win every game at that point, right? 
You got the game plan. God's got it. He knows it. Nothing catches God off guard. Have you ever thought about that? Nothing catches God off guard. Sometimes I think, oh, this is going to catch him off guard. I better take control of this. Yeah. You know, nothing catches him off guard. He's in charge. He's in control. He is the commander. We read about that in verse 15. Nations are like a drop in the bucket. Now think about that for a moment. Drops are just like it drops. You wipe it up, no big deal. That's what God does with nations, no big deal. They're like a drop in a bucket to him. And just as God's wisdom allows him to be the commander, also his power does as well. Look at verse 21 through 24. It talks about how God commands all human power. All the power of this world, you name it, will be power in power only as long as God says so. Because he can just go, and it's gone like stubble. It's gone. It's like chaff in the wind. Whatever you think is powerful, whatever you put your trust in, your money, your family, your job, the government, whatever you put your hope in and you think is powerful and will never let us down, it will let you down. Those are little G gods, right? God won't let you down. He demonstrated that to the disciples. They're sitting on the Sea of Galilee. They're in a boat. This massive storm's going. Jesus, the commander of it all, in a boat, sleeping. And they're freaking out. They're panicking. What's going on? What's going on? They wake up Jesus. Jesus says, how could you? Or they say to Jesus, how could you be sleeping? Jesus stands up, raises his hands, and he calms the winds and the wave, waves. And, and, and it's glass on the Sea of Galilee. Glass. Just like that. And what do they say? Who is this that he commands the winds and the wave? You know who he is? He is God. He is divine. He is God. Fully man, fully God. Wow. He's the commander. Now here I am. I get through this, and I look at this. God is the creator. God is the conqueror. God is the commander. I'm good. Done deal. I'm in. Check me in. Here we go. I'm ready. But Isaiah gives us another picture today. And I think it's a picture for maybe somebody here that's the most, in picture, most important picture of them all. And it's that God is a comforter. God is the comforter. See, the three previous descriptions of God confronts us with the Lord's majesty. With his greatness. With his bigness. But this is a description of his tenderness. Of his intimacy with us. He starts out in verse 1 there, comfort, comfort my people. It's to emphasize, he says it twice, because he wants them to know that he is the God of all comfort. He is the God of all compassion. And then he continues in what is referred to as tender speech here. Speech that would be appropriate for a grieving people, a lonely people, a people who are in need of hope. You see, the God of all comfort, I believe, comes to us two ways. Listen to this. I think this will be important for you. The God of comfort comes to us two ways. First, it comes in his greatness. We are comforted by his greatness. We are comforted by how big he is, how transcendent he is. Well, what I mean by and transcendent, I mean that God is truly incomparable. He is unique. Verse 18 and verse 25 speak of how, how could you compare anything to God? Nothing would compare to God. No thing, no place, no person No, anything is compared to God. God is truly unique. He's one of a kind. He is the incomparable one. And the message that we need to hear from that and receive from that is that in God's transcendence is to be understood not that he is so great that he cannot care, but that he's so great he cannot fail. See, the people... Of Isaiah's day at that point, they were beginning to think that God was so great, he was above them, and they were discounting him and thinking, what would he do? He's so out there. Do you ever think that way? God is so big. He's so transcendent. He, 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 He made the universe, those billions and trillions of stars. How could he pay attention to me? Well, here's the good news. It's because he is so big that he cares for you. It's because he knows everything that he knows where you're at. 
It's because he understands what true compassion is and what you need that he can deliver, that he can be your comforter. See, God is not so great that the details of your pain get lost. Rather, he is so great that the details of your pain are all cared for. God's greatness means that he cares. So we find comfort in God's greatness. And secondly, we find comfort in God's intimate presence. In his intimate presence in our life. You know, it's in those times where God comes to you in the still, small voice that you feel his comfort. You know, in a couple of weeks we're going to talk about Elijah. And that was a big deal for him. He was in this cave and he heard God's small, still. And it made a difference. It gave him assurance that God was still walking with him. So God comes to us in these intimate times. He comes to us through a daily communion with him. Daily God speaks to us. And we need to slow down and hear that. I have a great example of this in my household. Her name is Patty. It's my wife. 31 years. I have watched my wife rise early. She's not here, so we can talk about her. (laughs) I've watched her rise early, and when I mean early, I'm talking 4.30 in the morning. She gets up with three things. First, the all-important cup of coffee. Her Bible and her Savior. And she sits down, and she drinks her coffee, and she, she opens up her Bible, and she prays for us. And she prays. To the God who is intimate, the God who is mighty, but yet hears us. And I'm telling you today, I have a strong marriage and I have some adult children who love Jesus because my wife has committed that to prayer all the days of her life. That's good news. I'll take that. (laughs) Like when when I got stuff going on, I say, Patty, you been praying for me? And she'll say yes, and I'll say, okay, I'm good. It's, that's what I need, you know. But really, it's, it's not about Patty. It's about who she's praying to. It's about Jesus. It's about God. God is our comforter. He is the one. And he paints that picture so well for us in verse 11. It talks about God being the intimate, good shepherd. Listen to the words of verse 11. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. See, this is a picture of tenderness, of compassion, of protection, of care, of comfort, and all of which our Heavenly Father gives us as we walk daily with him in communion with him. And he gives us this picture of who he is, the good shepherd, but really it's a picture of Jesus. I think it's the clearest picture. I think Jesus is all over these these verses here, but this is very clear to me. He is the good shepherd. We read about that in the Gospels. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the one who tends the flock. Jesus comes to you in those intimate moments, and he tends for you. That means he feeds you. That means he's, he's all you need. And you need to stop searching to the little G gods to find that, because that's hollow. They topple over. So be fed, be nourished by the Spirit of Jesus. Be nourished in the Holy Spirit and in the person of Christ who is divine, who is God, who will bring you comfort. And then there's that next word, gather. The good shepherd gathers us in your arms. What a great, oh man, I got this little grandchild right now. And and when she'll let me, I pick her up. (laughs) Oh, wow, that's so cool to have a little baby in your arms. That's so comforting. Jesus does that. He picks us up. He gathers us. He gathers us together. He puts us in his arms. He knows our names. He cares for us. He would give his life for us. Matter of fact, Jesus did. And then there's that next word, carries. He carries us. He carries us where? In his bosom, next to his heart. He carries us. He carried the cross. 
carried the cross to Calvary. He sacrificed for us. And all we need to do is trust him and give him our heart. And then the last picture of Jesus here is Jesus leads us like a lamb that is pregnant with babies. Now that's important, that last part. Because a pregnant lamb, a shepherd would tell you, is very vulnerable. Are you feeling vulnerable today? God cares for you even in your fears. <laughs> even in your anxiety. Even when you are vulnerable. You just need to trust him. God is our creator. God is our conqueror. He's our commander, and he's our comforter. He's bigger than our world. <laughs> he's bigger than our idols. He's bigger than our stuff. He's bigger than our discouragements. And that brings us comfort. And he's also intimate, and he knows everything about us. And he wants to take us in. Will you let him do that? Will you put that anchor into the rock of Christ? Put the rope there, man, and come out of the valley and climb to that mountaintop and go home with him. You can. You can. By putting your confidence, your faith, your trust, repent of your sins, give him your life, and he's the difference maker. Because he is able.